Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Although Joel does not have his name up there, hopefully most of you already know. There we go. <laughs> so we are thrilled to have Joel Spencer here, and he's going to be talking about phase transitions for modified Erdős Rényi processes. Okay. Well, thank you, Jennifer. And I, I want to talk about today, um, I'll look at a specific phase transition that we've really been working at a, a lot and, and so that part will be a little technical but, but uh, also that it seems to apply to a number of them. Uh, here again is the quote from Fan Chung about Paul Erdős which I think is really gives some of the sense of that remarkable man. So let me start with the erdős rainy process itself um, which I think is really a um, a bedrock in, in understanding uh, finite phase transitions. So you begin with the, this was developed by Paul Erdős and Alfred Rainey in a paper in 1960 called The Evolution of Random Graphs. And you begin with an empty graph and each round you add a random edge so anything could happen and the graph evolves from empty to full and we're going to parameterize time, and I'd like to, hopefully I'll popularize this. I'll, I'll call it erdős rainy time. That's my own invention. That unit time is going to be n over 2 edges, which turns out to be the critical time. And there is what we'll call a phase transition at the critical time, which I've, I've set to be 1, when they're n over 2 edges. So let me tell you what the behavior is, but first, yeah, so that's exactly what I was going to say, that this is when the average degree is 1, and this is uh, really part of understanding what's going on, and we'll have some other aspects of it. So here is what happens in the subcritical phase, <clears throat> that is when the time t, this erdős rainy time, is less than 1, all the components are tiny, the biggest one is just logarithmic size. Even that's sort of an exaggeration. I mean, most of them are just two or three or four. Uh, and they're simple, which if you see on the bottom, means they're either trees or <clears throat> they could have a single cycle in them, but nothing more complicated than that. Uh, but then when you go to supercritical, when the time is bigger than one, then you have what Erdős and Rainey called the giant component, which is that these have come together, and there's a component whose size is a constant proportion of the points. And that component is quite complex. It's not a tree. It's not unicyclic. In fact, it's got all sorts of complicated stuff. All of the other components, it's not all the points, but all the other components are, are just tiny, and, and they are simple. Now, I should say something, though, about the asymptotics here. What I mean is you, you can't take t equal 1 minus 1 over n. You have to take t to be a constant less than 1, and then let, let n go to infinity. But So you can have 0.99. You have 0.99 times n over 2 edges. It's just all tiny components. 1.01 times n over 2, you have the giant component. And this is the basic idea. And we want to look closely at the, the, this phase transition. We want to look at what happens when you're at time 1 minus epsilon and what happens when you're at time 1 plus epsilon. And here, we'll have really a double limit. That is, for each fixed epsilon, we'll look at what happens as n goes to infinity. And then we'll look at the asymptotics as epsilon goes to zero. But we cannot take epsilon to be a function of n. You have to be careful of that. Actually, we can, but not in this, in this talk. Okay. And if it's barely supercritic, subcritical, is time 1 minus epsilon, we still have all the components uh, simple. 
And the largest component is logarithmic size, but also the, as a function of epsilon, the constant on the logarithm is epsilon to the minus 2. And then in the supercritical, we do get a giant component. And what proportion are in the giant component? It has linear growth. The proportion is 2 epsilon. So if we're 1% one, we're 1 above criticality, 2% of the points are in the giant component. Again, it's complex, and the others are simple. And all the other components besides the giant are at most this size, this epsilon to the minus 2. So we're getting a lot of critical exponents here. And here, the minus 2 is one of the critical exponents. Now, to me, what's going on is, is, is something that's been very well studied, the Galton-Watson birth process, which goes as follows. You, you start with a, a node. I call it Eve because in the actual literature, there were only males in the Galton-Watson process. Even the children were all male. It was just a totally <laughs> male thing. So, uh, what? But it's an asexual process, right? So it was, yeah, well, it was a British process, yes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> that's true. And uh, so here, the number of children, let's say Poisson, though later we could change that with mean lambda. And then the children have children by the same distribution, and you get a, a tree T. The critical value for the mean is 1. And if the lambda is less than 1, then the process will, with probability 1, will die out. Um, whereas if you're supercritical, that is, your expected number of children is greater than 1, well, you might die out because you might not have any children right at the start, but you'll have positive probability. Oh, that's, that's an error. <laughs> Sorry, the probability is not greater than 1. It's, it's greater than 0. Yeah. Oh, well. This is my first talk with this system, so there are going to be some, some glitches. I think that was a computer glitch. Absolutely. It's Microsoft. <laughs> right. Microsoft glitch. That's it. Uh, and so with positive probability, it can go on forever. And again, we want to look at what happens near criticality. That is, what happens if you're in a Poisson birth process and, and your births are Poisson mean 0.99 or Poisson mean 1.01. .01. So already we know 0.99, you, you die. Um, but you can look at the distribution and there are exact formulas for the distribution. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's really, what happened here? It's our fault. This is, this is a great. <laughs> <laughs> that was my fault. Here it is. OK. Um, but still, so it's going to be finite. What happens is the size of the distribution. What is going on? OK, well has a, a heavy tail. I went backwards. Until you reach around epsilon to the minus 2. In fact, this is a minus 3 halves function here. And then it starts dropping exponentially. So the idea is that if you're at Poisson 0.999 with epsilon equal 10 to the minus 3, it actually looks like you're at criticality at Poisson 1 until you get a million, until you get to around size a million. And then the effect of not being at point at 1, but rather at point 0.999 comes in, and, and then it starts dropping off exponentially. Yeah? Should we think about cardinality t as, as the total number of nodes in the tree? Or yes, yeah, exactly. Total number of nodes in the tree. That's what I mean by cardinality t. Yeah. Um, and if you're barely supercritical, there's at 1.01, .01, your chance of getting an infinite tree is, is around twice epsilon. And this can actually be found from the formulas. I'll say more about it. And there's a kind of duality that can be made precise that if you're barely supercritical and 
you don't have an infinite tree and you're at 1 plus epsilon, but you don't have an infinite tree, it looks like you're at 1 minus epsilon. It looks like you're barely subcritical. This is called duality. And so the distribution for 1 plus epsilon looks exactly like this, but there's a little chunk out at infinity because the tree might be infinite. And the connection is that when you look at the erdos rainy random graph where the average degree is lambda, if you take a point and do, say, breadth-first search from that point, that point has Poisson lambda neighbors, and then they have Poisson lambda neighbors, and they have Poisson lambda neighbors. So at least locally, the component looks like the Galton-Watson process. At some point, it has to break down because there are only n vertices, but locally it looks like that. Now I want to modify it and talk about the Bowman freeze process. So this is a particular one that, that we want to study, somewhat for historical reasons. Uh, we begin with an empty graph, and we do the following. Actually, each round, there are two, basically there are two random edges, and, and you look at the first random edge, and if it's between two isolated points, you add it. And if it's not between two isolated points, then you look at the second random edge. These are random edges, and, and that one you definitely put in. You, you don't do a third thing. You, you just So if the first, you, you pick a, ran, let me say it again, you pick a randomly chosen edge, edge. If it is between two isolated vertices, you add it. If not, you don't add it, but then you pick a random one, which might, again, be between two isolated vertices. So this is a way to sort of prefer the, um, the uh, isolated uh, vertices a little bit. And also it's an example of a process that's called the Akleoptis process, named after Dmitry Akleoptis, who was here, here being Redmond, uh, for a <laughs> while, and uh, is now at, is it Santa Clara? What's Santa? Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz, one of those Santa places in California, Santa Cruz. And, uh, and so he, in general, looked at these processes where you have what you could call the power of choice. In each round, there are two random edges, and you use some protocol to decide which one to pick. And his original question was, I, I want to, can I defer, using this power, the, uh, the phase transition? And historically, it was Bohm, Tom Bowman and, and Alan Fries looked at this process, this particular protocol, and showed it that it did defer it. And that was one of the reasons to, for the start of that. But I should say there, there are several other, the things I'll talk about today, there, there are other examples. You can look at Erdős, the normal Erdős Rényi, except instead of starting with a, an, uh, an empty graph, start with some particular graph, as long as it's sort of reasonable and then build up and, and then get the uh, uh, phase transition. And this rule could be, you could have all sorts of protocols for the Acleoptis. Uh, what bounded size means is that your decision about which of the two edges to add <laughs> just depends on the size of the vertices, size of the components that the vertices are in. And furthermore, there's a constant like 10 so that if the component has size bigger than 10, they're all treated the same. Anyway, so there's a whole class of protocols of which the, the Bowman freeze is only one. Um, or you could give some kind of preference to vertices with low degree or negative preference to vertices of low degree. So all of these are, <coughs> are processes where in each round you're adding an edge by some rule. And we want to look at the, the phase transition. And then what we're really not sure of is, is there a lot of these processes we can, will show that they look like the uh, Bowman freeze. They're in the same, they seem to be in the same universality class. There's not that the phase, sorry, they look like the, the erdos rényi Not that the phase transition is in the same place, but if you rescale it, it, it looks the same. But we don't really have a good feel about when that happens. It doesn't always happen, and, and when it doesn't happen. Now, 
if there's one thing I'd like you to take home today from, from this talk, it's this notion, but if you're in mathematical physics, you already know it. It's called the susceptibility. Uh, on an infinite grid, when you're doing percolation and all the points look the same, the susceptibility is denoted by chi, but chi is already in use in graph theory for chromatic numbers. So I'm going to turn it to S. And, and chi is the expected size of the cluster containing the origin. But the origin looks like any other point. In terms of a graph, a finite graph, the susceptibility is the following statistic. Select a point at random and look at the number of points in its component. And what is the expected value of that? And that's the susceptibility of a graph. This is something that really has not been looked at so much for graphs. And I, th I th really think it should be. I think I, in, st in studying random processes, I think it's the key statistic uh, to look at. And while I like to think of it this way, at the same time, if you have a component of size A, A times you're getting the value A. So it, it's 1 over the number of vertices times the sum of the squares of the cluster size. So the fact that you've got these two things is, is sometimes handy. Now, here's an argument that really got me going, just looking at the erdos rainy process, if you, what happens when you add an edge? Well, suppose you have two clusters, C and C prime, that merge. That is, there's an edge between them. Then what happens is the sum of the squares is replaced by the square of the sums. And so the susceptibility goes up by uh, twice the product over n. Because remember, the susceptibility, you're dividing by the number of vertices. So what happens when you add a single edge? So that means you're increasing time by 2 over n. For each pair of clusters, for each pair of components, you have a probability size of c over n of picking the first point from the first one. Similarly, for the second one. And if you do, you're adding the product. So you, you get. This is, now this is actually, uh, there's a, a strong bit of hand waving here because s of t is really a random variable. And yet I'm going to treat it like a function. And proving that that's okay takes a lot of work, a lot of work. Okay. Now, if you happen to add an edge between two points in the same component, you wouldn't be having any effect. But let's ignore that. If you're subcritical, the idea is that you don't have large components, so that's not going to happen very often. So if we ignore that, by ignoring that, we just remove the condition that C and C prime have to be different. Um, and then what we get is 2 over n times the square of the susceptibility. Remember, susceptibility was, was uh, 1 over n times the sum of the component sizes squared. So this is just the square of the susceptibility. Now you, this is the difference in the susceptibility. You divide by delta t. You know, it's funny, I, I've been a discrete mathematician all my career, but in the later part of my career, I've, I've realized that there's something useful about calculus. You know, it's, it's really, you know, it's a handy thing. I mean, it's, it's, ah. And here's an example. So you divide by 2 over n, and then you turn it into a differential equation, because 2 over n is about as close to 0 as you're going to get. And so you get that the derivative of s is the square, the derivative of s is the square of s. And at, at initially, the susceptibility is 1. And so you get a solution that the susceptibility as a function of time is uh, 1 over 1 minus t. And it has a critical point at t equals 1, where the, the susceptibility goes to infinity. And that, indeed, is when the giant component appears. So, yeah? Maybe I would just if, you, if you set t u 1 minus epsilon, yeah. then you get your epsilon 1 over epsilon, not 1 over epsilon squared? No, you get 1 over, the susceptibility is 1 over epsilon. Oh. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. In fact, we'll, we'll look at that, yeah. So the, 
the behavior, we'll, we'll show a graph, the behavior near the critical point is like 1 over epsilon, and that will be important. Now, if you do it for Bowman freeze, first we can look at the proportion of isolated points. And, and this is, uh, doesn't involve the susceptibility. When you add a random edge, either the, the first choice was between two isolated vertices, which happens with probability x1 squared. And then it, it, it goes down by the proportion of isolated vertices goes down by 2 over n because those two went up. Or you added a, a random edge, which happens with this probability. And with a random edge, each point is an isolated point with chance x1 over n. So you get 2x1 over n. Again, these are expected values. And a lot of the hand waving in this talk is treating them as functions. And then that turns into a differential equation which uh, you can give to your favorite graduate student, and he will come up with a nice curve for you. And so this is x1 of t. Um, I should point out that this number here, which is 1.17, will turn out to be the critical value for Bowman freeze. But notice it, it's smooth for x1. This is somewhat similar with Erdős Rényi. If you look at isolated points at t at, at time t, the number of isolated the proportion of isolated vertices is e to the minus t. There's nothing critical about t equals one with respect to the function e to the minus t. And now you do susceptibility, and there are two cases with chance x1 squared. You join to isolated vertices. So 1 squared plus 1 squared becomes 2 squared. So it goes up by 2 over n. Or you add a random edge, and that's what we did in erdős rényi and it goes like this. And so we get uh, a differential equation where x1 has already been solved. It was the, the, the graph that we already had. Now this does not have a, a clean solution, but it can be simulated, and it explodes at uh, 1.17. And Nick Wormald and I proved that this is where the giant component does appear. This is the critical point. And here there's a definite analog to what was a very difficult result in, in terms of, um, of percolation on, on uh, ZD or, or other lattices, which is that the, the place where the susceptibility goes to infinity is the same place where the giant component appears. Uh, and we were able to show that. And here's another picture. There's S of t. The reason why it explodes, S of t has a, has a term with an s squared in it. And so if you have a differential equation and s, is, s, is, s prime is being pushed by s squared, it's going to explode in finite time. But where it explodes, it just happens to be this value. Now, if we look at things barely uh, supercritical, when, if we look at, uh, let's just do it for Galt and Watson, suppose you're Poisson 1 plus epsilon, and this is, is classical stuff here. What is the probability that the process will die? Well, if you call it z, if you have, uh, if the, if Eve has i children, then it's z to the i, because all of the nodes, all of the children, their families have to die. So you get a recursive equation, z equals the sum of the probability that the root node has i children times z to the i. In the particular case of Poisson, it comes out very nicely. You get z equals e to the z minus 1 lambda. And if you replace z by, by 1 minus z, which is the probability of being infinite, you get this equation 1 minus y equals e to the minus 1 plus epsilon times y. And now what happens here here's 1 minus y and if you look at the function e to the minus 1 plus epsilon y 
it starts here. At 0, the value is 1. Its derivative is minus 1 plus epsilon. So it's going a little bit under. I mean, I can't really draw it with epsilon equal 0.01. This, think of the, the, the exponential curve as going a little bit under the line 1 minus i. But then its second derivative is going to pull up. And there's going to be a crossing point, And this is going to be the critical value for y. And this is going to be the probability. And it's a nice exercise, a uh, tough exercise for calculus students if they really understand epsilons and deltas. But let me give the heuristic for it. If you just take the Taylor series and for, for this and say it's 1 minus 1 plus epsilon y, and then we'll include the quadratic term. But on the quadratic term, we won't make it 1 plus epsilon. We'll simply make it 1 half. Okay. And then ignore everything else. Then you get that y is around 2 epsilon. And indeed, that's a nice calculus exercise to, to prove that indeed, uh, say, the limit of, of y over 2 epsilon equals 1. Uh, here, a little tricky. There are a lot of false proofs because it's easy to get into a circular thing, and this connects to the giant because what's happening in Erdős Rényi is you have a point and it's looking locally like this Poisson one plus epsilon, and if the Poisson one plus epsilon would have gone on forever, well, it can't go on forever, but it joins the giant component, and so the size of the giant component is two epsilon. N. And the critical exponent is that, it, that it's linear. It's 2 epsilon to the first times n. Now what happens in general, or not totally in general, but in the cases we're interested in, if you have Galt and Watson, and if the expected number of births is just a little bit bigger than 1, and the expected square number of births is some number a, and the higher moments don't mess you up, which is something you really have to look at. Then you do the same analysis. You only look at the first two moments. And what you get is that y is, has linear growth, 2a times, times epsilon. But this is, so there's a number of limits here. And, and this fact that this has to be moderate plays a key role because I mean, I'm cutting off the Taylor series at the y squared term, and, and you have to make that legitimate. Okay. Now what happens with Bowman freeze in terms of the analysis of it is the key thing is uh, to analyze the susceptibility at near criticality. We know it goes to infinity, but how does it go to infinity near criticality? And what happens is it explo the, the critical point is just some number, which happens to be around 1.1763. And the scaling is by this number, which is the percentage of time you add a random edge near criticality. Because remember, x1 is the, the number of isolated vertices. Here we're at criticality. So this is the chance that the first edge is not between uh, two isolated points. So these are the random edges you're adding. So an analysis of the differential equation, though the differential equation doesn't have a clean solution, we can still analyze what it looks like near criticality. And what it looks like is it goes up like epsilon to the minus 1. And in fact, it goes up like alpha epsilon to the minus 1. And then, very important to the analysis, we look not only at the susceptibility, we look at the higher moments. So S3 would be the expected value of the component size squared when you pick a random point. And S4 uh, is the expected size of the component size cubed. Or, well, whether it's 3 or 4, we can write it this way. The uh, S3 is the 1 over the number of vertices times the sum of the cubes. And again, you get a differential equation for S3 when you look at putting in a random edge. 
and seeing what happens, and you can do it for Erdős Rényi. And what happens is you get a differential equation that you can't really solve too well. Uh, either you've picked two isolated points, in which case one cube plus one cube turned into two cube, so it went up by six, but somehow you're dividing by two, so you put in a three. And then the other time you're putting in a random edge, and then it turns out you you, you, you get something, you can work it out. And though you can't solve this differential equation neatly, you can do an asymptotic analysis near criticality. And that's the important thing. So what happens is the, the, the important factor is that near criticality, susceptibility looks like alpha epsilon to the minus 1. And the next moment has an epsilon to the minus 3 times some constant. And this turns out to be the key thing, yeah. So is there a way, uh, alternatively, to kind of understand this Bowman freeze modification on the local level? Or is that very com in that, is there some kind of modified Poisson tree that one could think about to bias towards connecting with you? Yeah, I, I wish, I wish, I, I don't know. I've thought about that. I haven't come up with something. But that's a very good question. Does it look locally the same? That would be, uh, un it, it can't, right? It, it just doesn't seem to. Yeah, I don't know. I, I have thought about that question. I, I mean, we can talk about it offline. But I, it, it's been, I wish there was. Maybe there. I'm not saying there isn't, but I haven't been able to find it. Yeah. And indeed, you can find even the higher moments. And indeed, with one, one's going to need that the next higher moment is not too awful. And then the key thing in the analysis for Bowman freeze, we want to look. Here's T critical. We want to look at the behavior slightly supercritical. And what we do is look at the behavior on the other side, slightly subcritical. And then we jump over thinking that with a proportion of, with that proportion alpha of the time, we're adding a random edge. So we're at near criticality, and then we, we're basically adding random edges. And there's actually some fine tuning about the relationship. Well, both of these numbers are small, but we want to get here. And it turns out we should go about 10 times further over here. But, and, there's, there's some, and a lot of that is that third moment that I said, ignore, ignore. You can't really ignore it. You have to really pay attention to it. And it turns out, yeah. You even have to look at the higher moments, but I mean, it works out. But you have to you have to do this do this right. So now, what happens when you're at a graph with high susceptibility, and then think of it that that you take this graph and then you add random edges with a certain probability. So in your graph, so we can think of this as like a two-stage Poisson birth process. Think of picking a random point. And then let's say that in the graph that we're starting with, that is this graph over here, there are a proportion ci of points that are in components of size i. So if you pick a random point, it's in a component of size i. And then all of them. You're adding these random edges, and you want to know how many new points, uh, how many new points you get. But again, I keep pressing this button the wrong way. So you can think of this as a grandchild. You pick a random point, look at its component size, which is what you already know from here. And then, if the component has size i, it then goes out to Poisson i times this number uh, of new points. And then those new points are random points. And then you do it again. And what happens then is you've just set things up so that the expected number of children is barely over 1. And the expected number of uh, the square is reasonable. And then if you ignore the higher moments, which again, you actually can't.
can't do too well. I mean, you really have to look at them more carefully. What you wind up getting, and this was the result, and I should say that this was joint with um, Svante Janssen, you get linear growth. You get linear growth. So Bowman freeze has linear growth at the point. To me, the key thing in, in this analysis was looking at the susceptibility and the higher moments at the near, at the barely subcritical range. And then you want to use that and jump over to the barely supercritical range. But they have to have the right exponents to, to do it. So now let me advertise uh, my student. It's one of the pleasures of, of uh, being here, uh, is always all of these uh, great uh, postdocs and, and graduate students. So let me, let me advertise my own uh, student who just finished, Will Perkins. And uh, he analyzed the Bowman freeze process. He just uh, completed. And I'm sure you'll be seeing him at meetings here and there. And he's just uh, going to Georgia Tech, the postdoc, with my former student, Prasad Tatali, who's also a frequent visitor here. So this is really a, a Microsoft kind of, uh, kind of uh, family here. And so he also looked at it, and he found many, many results. I'll, I'll just mention a couple of them. He looked at the second largest component in the barely supercritical, and he found that it was epsilon to the minus 2 log n, which is the same as the erdos rainy So this is the sense that you're getting the same exponents. The, the log n, we, we knew. The thing is, how does it behave with epsilon? What is the exponent in epsilon? The smaller epsilon is, the big, this is a little counterintuitive. The, the smaller epsilon is, the bigger the second largest component is. Because when you're supercritical, the second largest component is getting smaller. Because it's getting sucked into the largest one all the time. So, and it, it goes like epsilon to the minus 2. Also, he found uh, quite a number of results about the nature of the components. Basically, in the subcritical, uh, there were a couple of unicyclic ones, but there was nothing more complicated than that. And indeed, he gave the distribution on the number of unicyclic components. And here's a nice conjecture that he and I, I mean, I looked at it as well. He, he conjectured that the same thing held in the barely subcritical, that is at, at 1 minus epsilon, that the largest component would be epsilon to the minus 2 log n. Now, this, this is morally correct for several reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that it's true for erdos rainy and we think the two processes look the same, so it should be here, too. Another reason is the duality, that the largest component barely subcritical and the second largest component barely supercritical should look the same. And he proved the result for the for the barely supercritical. A third reason was that he did get a bound in one of the two directions, and I, now I forget which one, but he, he does have. And then there's even a fourth thing where he had a beautiful argument using the Laplace transform, and there was just an interchange of limits. That, so this remains a, a very nice conjecture. I, I think it's great to have a thesis where there's something you don't prove. I think that's, that's a, because he proved. Hmm? Is that C C two in the supercritical uh, like C one should take care of like uh, epsilon uh, two epsilon uh, and edges and then the rest uh, should looks I like the subcritical. Level. Yes, exactly. That's that's exactly the picture. That if you if your epsilon supercritical and you erase the giant component, sometimes called duality, then you are epsilon subcritical. And this certainly happens in the critical exponents in the mathematical physics literature, there's this strong feeling that if you, like if you condition on not being in an infinite component when you're barely supercritical, it's as if you're, you're in the barely super subcritical. But again, that's a feeling. That's not a, that's not a, a theorem. And let me add to some breaking. This just appeared. I haven't had a chance to look at it. I just, got it in the email. One nice thing about being senior is people send you these incredible results. And it's really, so I don't even know, I don't know who these people are. I don't know. I know where UNC is. That's, that's, I know that. But, but they just sent me this result 
So let me at least describe what the result is and, and talk about the critical window for a moment. So I said we're looking at epsilon fixed. Let, let's just think about Erdős Rényi. But actually then you could say, well, what if you let epsilon go down to zero with n? And it turns out the critical parameterization, this was one of the great advances, is that the right parameterization around t critical equals 1 is 1 plus lambda over n to the 1 third. And this exponent has to be 1 third. That's the right answer. And what happens here is lambda can be positive or negative. If lambda is going to plus infinity, things look like the supercritical. You don't yet have a giant component, but you have a dominant component that is a, a, a Jupiter compared to the... Actually, I said that once, and somebody had their laptop, and they, they actually found the ratio of Saturn to... It's actually, Jupiter isn't that big. <laughs> I mean, Saturn... Well, or let me put it this way. Actually, Saturn's pretty big. So it's not that Jupiter has 99% of the... I always thought Jupiter had 99% of the mass in the solar system. It's not true. But still, I, I think of it. Oh, 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 oh. I can't do that. Oh, God. Oh, no, my whole thing. No, you didn't see that. That, that, was, that was the quiz. Hold on. Pretend you didn't see it. Okay. So the, this, this scaling gives the critical window where you actually see, and you can do it with computer simulation, the components coming uh, together in a nice way. And what their result is that the same scaling, well, with a little bit of changing the constants, works for, uh, for Bowman freeze. So it's an exciting uh, result. So let me, let me close before, my, before the closure that I already showed uh, with a cautionary tale. Um, you know, I know it's very tempting to just put this on the computer and simulate it. And, and, and I, I fell from grace. So this is a morality. All my life, I, if I had a paper, it was just theorem, theorem, theorem. And I said, well, you know, I can do what I want, right? <laughs> so here was a process. So, so the black process, R is actually, uh, um, is half of Erdős Rényi time for some reason. So ER is, is Erdős Rényi, um, and, and the vertical is the size of the giant component, and it goes up at zero. And then for Bowman freeze, it, it starts a little bit later, but it has a kind of similar picture. But then we looked at something called the product rule. This is what Dimitri Akliaptis, whose process is named for, so again, two uh, Microsoft people in Risa de Sousa, who's now also in California. I keep forgetting. There's somebody. Davis. Davis, right? Thank you. One of those UC. One of those UC places, yes. So we we looked at the, in the product rule, you have two potential edges, and for each edge, you look at the product of the component sizes of the two vertices, and you pick the edge that's where the product is smaller. And this has the property that you're minimizing susceptibility. So it seems like a reasonable thing to look at. And what happens is that process, there's a very strong anti-gravity. If you've got two moderate-sized components, they're not going to come together because their product is really high. Now, at some point, they have to come together. And so what happens is when you have a powerful anti-gravity, it stops things from coming together, but then when they come together, there's this huge explosion, and they come together really fast. And here was the, the picture. I mean, it just zoomed up. The giant component zoomed up to about 80% in, in zero time, or so we thought. Or so we thought. So, we, we, so there were no proofs. In fact, we still have absolutely no handle on the product rule. But uh, uh, Dimitri and Ryza and I uh, wrote a paper saying that the product rule looks like a first order phase transition, which is very exciting. That it that it's a there's a discontinuity when you when you scale appropriately and you look at the proportion of points in the giant component as a function of time.
there's a critical point and then it jumps to, to point six in a discontinuous way. Actually, in the article, it was, we said something stronger than looks like. <laughs> but now I'll just say we said it looks like. But then uh, Oliver Reardon and his student, uh, Lutz Varnke, just uh, recently have a really remarkable combinatorial result, which says they, they don't say what product rule actually looks like. In fact, they don't talk about product rule at all. They say take any Acleoptis process. So you're getting two edges, and you can use any protocol at all to decide which edge to pick. And then you're going to have a continuous phase transition. It's not going to jump in, in zero time. Some of you may have been here last year, or last January, I think it was, when there was this luncheon thing where I gave this two giant, uh, no two giants conjecture, which was, can you have a protocol where with positive probability you'd get two giant components? Let's say giant is n over 100. And I conjectured that, and, and it seemed like that would be totally, uh, it seemed very unlikely because if you had it, it would be totally unstable. And all my attempts at proving it had failed, so I finally said, well, I'll, I'll make it a conjecture. And it turns out the conjecture was true, and it does follow from, from Reardon and Varnke's uh, stuff, but it's not at all easy to prove because their proof is, is really very, very ingenious. At first you think, well, how can this be hard? I mean, if you had two giant components, boom, they'd come right together. But the fact that, they're, that it's unstable doesn't mean it won't occur. It could occur just for a moment and then, and then disappear. But in fact, they showed it doesn't occur. So, so now, well, I've already given away the answer, but maybe some of you didn't, um, didn't see it. So, and I wouldn't know the answer to this either, but, but I've been coming to uh, Microsoft since uh, Jennifer and Christian came here, really. And in all that time, there was one talk that was the, the uber geek talk. No, it wasn't Christian. It wasn't, <laughs> and it, it wasn't my daughter's talk, which is the number two talk on my list. But it was this guy came to Redmond and, and gave a talk. And, and it was on, there were people there that were so geeky, even Microsoft kept them hidden. I mean, it was really, <laughs> I mean, it was just an incredible uh, day. And he gave a wonderful talk, and everybody was excited. So if, like me, you, you don't know the picture, uh, the answer is that, well, here he is, the most popular Microsoft speaker, really far and away. Yeah. Uh, and the answer is uh, Neil Stephenson. Stevenson. And Stevenson. Stevenson, sorry. Neil Stevenson. And, you know, you can open up any one of his books to a, a random page, and you'll get a wonderful quote. Uh, but uh, this is one of my favorites, and uh, maybe it's something I should have remembered when I wrote that paper. <laughs> But, uh, I think I'll finish on, on that note. So thank you very much. You know, we're saying from the beginning of Kryptonomicon, Christian and I. No. Oh, my you God. One of our best I knew friends. you guys were famous, but. Yeah. You know, actually, a lot of people have said to us that's the most impressive thing about us is that Neil thanks us. We introduce him to lots of cryptographers. Oh, my goodness. So. That is. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad I finished with this. That, yeah. is, that is. Four or two friends that we introduced Neil to cryptographers. That his is fantastic. His more recent book on his blog, yes. he says, was inspired by all the weird people. You know how it's. Mathematicians yeah. like monks in these little rooms. This is he the an was, anathem, yeah. an anthem, or whatever, however yeah. you say it. Yeah, he says that's because of all the weird people okay. we introduced him. Well, that's, that's next on my reading list. <laughs> so, I, uh, so you didn't know that? You didn't I, know any of that? I remembered you had some connection, but I didn't. <laughs> I, didn't I thought you had met him on the street one day or something. <laughs> <laughs>